Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome back to the YouTube channel. My name is John Campia, and this is Open Mic, this show here that we do a lot of the afternoons during the week, where it's more casual, laid back, where we just basically hear from you guys about what it is, the issues you guys want to talk about. I'm, of course, your host today, John Campia. It is awesome to have you guys here this afternoon. Had a fun time on the John Campia show this morning, actually. We had a really good show this morning. Talked about a bunch of different things, uh, me and Rob, and, of course, uh, Taylor and Jonathan and Ray were in here. It was really good. And one of the things we talked about this morning was the fact that it's Avatar Week. It's here. The sequel to the biggest single film in the history of cinema is today, or is this week at any rate, 48 hours from now. Uh, literally 48 hours from now, I will be sitting in a movie theater watching Avatar. I'm sure many of you guys will as well. Now, look, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of the original Avatar. Like, I thought the original Avatar was a very, very good movie. I didn't think it should have won. Like, it was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards, and I have no problem that it was nominated. Uh, I remember that year, though, there were a lot of people who were really, really, with great conviction, felt like Avatar should win Best Picture at the Academy Awards. I was not one of those people. But it's a really good movie. I mean, I get it. I get it. I get it. I know there are people who think they sound cool by taking anything that's really popular and going, oh, it's not so good. I, I, I get it. It's the cool thing. It's the cool thing to, to bash and hate on Avatar. I get that. That's fine. But uh, I'm not going to lie to you, man. It was, it was a really great movie. Um, and I, while Avatar 2 is not like in my top two or three, nor has it been in my top two, three or four most anticipated movies of 2022, it's certainly something to be excited about. Listen, guys, when the sequel to the biggest film of all time is coming out, it's something to get excited about. And, you know, the critics are now weighing in. Now, we saw the initial reactions, right? We talked about the initial reactions for Avatar last week, and they were very good, like super positive. A lot of people talking about, we're glowing, saying it's probably going to get a Best Picture nomination, and certainly some other awards bodies have definitely been nominating and putting up Avatar The Way of Water for Best Picture consideration and stuff like that. So that's all been there, understood. But some people in the initial reactions were saying, you know what, the story's a little convoluted in places and blah, 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 but visually it's gorgeous. So now the full reviews are now out. And if we go over and take a look, right now Avatar The Way of Water F with 117 reviews being counted currently, it holds a very good, not like super awesome, the most incredible thing ever, but a very good 85% on Rotten Tomatoes right now. Now, if we go in and then start break it down, let's go in and we'll actually go to the top critics and take a look at what the top critics are saying. And for the vast most part, the top critics, I'd say about 80 plus percent of the top critics are giving it a... Uh, positive stuff. Like for instance, the CNN review right here says James Cameron, uh, has done it again with avatar, the way of water, a state of the art exercise that, uh, rekindles the sense of wonder and demands to be seen by anyone with lingering interest in watching movies in theaters, which I think is a, you know, that's a pretty great review. I like that. Um, inverse writes, it demands to be seen on the biggest screen that you can. Most people are saying that it demands to be seen on the biggest screen you can find so that, uh, the most potent elements from its impossible scale and skillful spectacle, uh, to its more complicated range of emotions and thematic romanticism can be completely absorbed. So great, great stuff. Then, you know, there are also a couple of not so great ones. We look over to the Seattle times and the reviewer from the Seattle times says like the original, it's Dances with Wolves in Outer Space, only dumber, which, I mean, is to be expected. If you were somebody that did not like the original Avatar, I, it's totally fair that maybe they went in and watched the sequel and also didn't like the sequel. Totally fair. And there's a little bit of that. I did notice from a couple of the reviews that I saw that uh, the reviewers were also people who did not like the original. Again, that's totally fair, but it makes sense. You know, if you didn't like the original, yeah, you're probably more likely not to like the newer one of well, Chicago Tribune liked it a lot. Uh, they said the way of water has a way of pulling. Oh, that's the wrong one. Here we go. The way of water has a way of pulling uh, you, you in, surrounding you with gorgeous, violent chaos and finishing with a quick rinse to get the remnants of its teeny tiny plot out of your eyes by the final reel and credits. Uh, and again, that's pretty consistent with a lot of the reviews that we've been hearing 
that a lot of the reviews love the story, love the spectacle of it. Almost everybody says visually it's gorgeous and immersive and exciting, but some... Even the ones who say they really, really like the film, some say either the film, the plot of the film was a little overdone, like there was a little bit too much, or that even what was there was kind of thin, even if it was a little bit convoluted or saying it's a little bit thin. But again, when you go through the most part of the top, of the top, and again, I brought up the wrong screen, of the top critics, uh, like there's one more negative one. Um, from Mashable is up there, but the Polygon, Chicago Sun Times, San Jose Mercury, Screen International, Empire Magazine, Time Out Magazine, Arizona Republic, uh, New York Post. Uh, it, it just, for the most part, the critics, even the top critics, these are all the top critics here, seem to really like the film. Now, will we like the film? Will you guys like the film? Will I like the film? Who knows? We'll find out. But I do know I'm excited to see it. And you guys know me. I don't I do not like 3D. 3D to me, and no offense to anybody who does like 3D. If you like 3D, awesome. I'm that's great. For me, for you guys who've watched me for any period of time, you know, I believe 3D is a useless gimmick and completely stupid and unnecessary. Now I did like Avatar, the first Avatar in 3D, but I liked it just as much without 3D. But I have just so you know, I am gonna go see it. Thursday at 3 p.m. in an IMAX 3D screen. So I'm going to be watching it in 3D, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But I, I got to be honest with you guys, I'm pretty excited about seeing this movie. I'm very, very excited about it. Anyway, guys, what are you guys thinking about? Uh, the idea of three, uh, 3D, the idea of Avatar, it's now here, the sequel to the biggest film of all time. Are you guys looking forward to seeing it? Do you have your tickets already? How big do you think it'll be? Whatever you think. Jump down into the comment section below and let me know your thoughts or use the super chat feature instead of them in. Just so you guys know, we do have the super chats open right now. I'm only going to leave them open for a little bit while longer. So if you've got a thought, theory, or opinion, go ahead and fire those in. But for now, let's do what we're here to do and get over to those thought, theories, and opinions that you guys have. And we are going to start with, hold on a second, let me just get the, uh, I've got to get this more centered properly here. Forgive me for that. I accidentally moved it. There we go. And we're going to get started here with JW who writes, uh, Joker two is my most anticipated film of 2024. Well, I get that. I mean, listen, that first Joker movie, you guys know how excited I was when they announced it. Uh, I thought it was a tremendously gripping movie, unlike any other comic book film you're going to see. And I, it never, planned on having a sequel. I still don't even know if they should be doing a sequel for it, to be honest with you, but they are. And uh, it's hard not to be excited about because the first one was so damn good. All right. Lou writes, the play, the pale blue eye drops on Netflix on January 6th. Gothic thriller with Christian Bale as a detective assassinated by a young Edgar Allan Poe interested. How can you not be interested in something Christian Bale's in? And I don't say that because you know, the, an actor in a film can certainly help a film, but an actor in a movie is not going to take a bad movie and suddenly magically make it a good movie. But Christian Bale is pretty picky about the movies he will be in. Now, you may want to point at Amsterdam that was just out this year, and yeah, that was not very good. But, you know, that was working with David O. Russell, a, a director that he has worked with a lot over the years and has had some really, really big success with. So I get him doing that. But generally speaking, Bale is pretty picky about the movies he'll do. Therefore, if he selected this movie as one of the movies he wants to do, I'm going to be interested in it. So, yeah. And the trailer dropped the other day, too. All right. Chef Rigo writes in, our friend Chef Rigo writes in and says, uh, no movie comment or question, but can we just take a moment to appreciate my Dallas Cowboys for being 10 and 3? I know we're going to choke in the playoffs, but just let me have this moment, please. Bring on the filthy. Oh, Chef Rigo. Oh, I I'm sorry to break this to you, but... Your Dallas Cowboys that are, ooh, 10 and 3, that this weekend barely, thanks to some help from some refs too, but barely got by, what is it, the 1 and 10 uh, Houston Texans? Like they were literally a minute away from losing to the 1 and 10 Houston Texans. And of course you're right, they're going to choke in the playoffs. Of course they are. But uh, hey, it's been, a, it's been a nice regular season. They're certainly having a better regular season than Tom Brady is right now, right? What are they at now? Six and seven? 
the Buccaneers, is still going to make the playoffs. But uh, they're certainly having a much better season than they are, that's for sure. All right, next up, Amin writes, uh, haven't been able to watch the show live for a bit. Uh, was at the World Cup for a week. Very nice. Uh, got back last week and caught a nasty cold. Slowly starting to feel better now. When are you seeing Avatar 2? Well, first of all, that's awesome that you got to go to the World Cup. I'm not a huge soccer fan, but that is like the biggest event in the world. Uh, maybe other than the Super Bowl. If you can go to that thing, that's amazing. I am seeing it again. Less than 48 hours, 47 and a half hours from now. So it is now almost 3.30. It's it's 3.26, so almost 3.30 in the afternoon, Los Angeles time. I am going to go see Avatar Thursday at 3 p.m. Uh, stoked about it. It's going to be me, Ann, and Ray are going to go see it together. And I'll be doing my out-of-theater reaction, obviously, for it. So uh, here's hoping it's good, man. I mean, I really hope it's good because this damn movie is like three hours and 20 minutes long. Cause and it, So if it sucks... I'll be sitting through a really long, sucky movie. So at three and a half, oh, at almost three and a half hours long, I really, really hope it's good. All right. Thanks a lot for that, Amin. All right. Amin also writes, uh, is there still a way to help out with the adoptive family or is that now done? Also, will there be a video again this year of the family's reaction? So yeah, for those of you who don't know, we're doing our adoptive family. And we, of course, did that last year. You know, we've talked about it. Now, as of right now, if you want to, although I am going to be shutting it down in the next day or two, if you want to uh, still contribute, we still do have the um, uh, GoFundMe page active. The GoFundMe page is still active. And as you can see, like you guys have already raised 4,600 bucks, almost 4,700 bucks. I am going to leave that up there. If you're wondering where you can find that, if you go onto the YouTube channel and you click on the community tab, okay, uh, I'll show you where you can find that. If so, if you go onto the onto the uh, YouTube channel, right, to the John Campy YouTube channel, right up at the top here, you see a bunch of uh, links, and you see the one that says community. If you click on community, the very top post is this one about, hey, if you guys want to contribute to the family, then go ahead, click the GoFundMe link, and it will bring you to this page, and you can go ahead and donate. Now, what I am going to do is we're going to take uh, the money that you guys raise, and then I'm going to top, I'm going to personally top that up to $10,000. And then we're going to give a $10,000 check um, to that family. They don't know that, but we're going to be giving them on top of all the gifts that you guys bought from the Amazon wish list. And it's unbelievable the way you guys got behind the Amazon wish list. We, you guys bought 50 $25 Amazon cards. So that's like 1250 bucks or something. You guys bought like 10 $100 grocery store gift cards. So thank you for that. You guys bought two Nintendo switches because they've got six kids in the family. You guys bought six Android tablets because again, a bunch of uh, kids uh, in the family, uh, tons of clothes, socks, daily needs, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to be giving them that. And then we're going to be giving them the money that you guys raise. Plus I'll kick in whatever extra personally that's going to take it up to 10,000. Plus we're going to give them a check for $10,000. And we're going to give this family the best Christmas ever. Now, last year we recorded a, a video of us giving it to the family. Now that was only because though, when we told the family about where everything was coming from, uh, they asked to be able to give a personal message to everybody. Now, of course, we are filming us wrapping the presents, the gifts coming in, loading up the presents, taking it to the family, but we're not going to put the family on camera unless they ask to be on camera, right? Because that's a violation of privacy. So if they ask just like last year's family did, we will. Other than that, we will still do a video of us doing everything else, going out to them and, and bringing the presents, but we're not going to put the family on camera, especially because they have kids. We're not going to put them on camera unless they ask or say it's okay to do so. So I can't tell you right now if we're going to have that family on camera or not. That's going to be up to them. Um, and we, of course, we're not going to we're not going to throw it on them to, Hey, we just give you all the stuff. You better make this video for us. But if they ask for it, we definitely will. Um, but, uh, but we will make a video either way and let you guys know about it. So thank you for asking for that, man. I appreciate that very much. Okay. Let's keep going here. Um, thanks for that. Amin. next up, we got CJ rebirth who writes, uh, I, I love the speed racer movie and think it's underrated. I'm glad you do. I think it's garbage. 
But uh, hey, that's the definition of an underrated movie, right? An under to you, an underrated movie is a movie that most people don't like, but you find value in. That's the definition of underrated. Like, there's no point saying, I think Star Wars is underrated. Well, that's not what... Everybody loves Star Wars. You can't say that's underrated. That's what an underrated movie is. Now, I think Speed Racer is garbage, but to you, it has a lot of value. And to you, that's an underrated film. And that's a good thing. All right. Thanks, CJ. Next up, Ben Rayner writes, Hey, John, I don't know if you listen to Michael Rosenbaum's podcast. From time to time, I do. Uh, from time to time, I do. Uh, but he just is called Inside of You, I think is the name of his podcast. But he just, uh, he, j but he just, Dad on Sam. Hey, John, I don't know if you listen to the Michael Rosenbaum podcast, but he just dad on Sam. You probably meant to say he just had on Sam Levine and it was a great one. Uh, Sam's a film nerd and he gets uh, into his time on Inglorious Bastards. Uh, you'd like it. Well, I really like Rosenbaum's podcast uh, because Number one, yeah, he's got some really interesting guests. That's fine. But he gets them to talk about really interesting things. You know, so whether he's got Jensen Ackles or whether he's got, um, uh, uh, why am I freezing on the name of the guy who played Superman in Smallville? Who played Clark in, in Smallville? Um, and he was just, in, I, why am I freezing? I talk about him all the time and I say his name all the time. Anyway, if you guys remember that guy's name, go ahead and put it in the, in the live chat there. I'll, I'll find it there. But he always asks uh, Tom Welling. Thanks. The fanboy was the first guy to put in Tom Welling. That's right. Tom Welling. Um, he, he gets them to talk about really interesting stuff. And that's the really cool thing about it. So thanks for give, putting that on the radar, man. All right. Jared Vester writes, Hey, John, out of curiosity, is A Quiet Place no longer uh, your favorite movie of the year 2018? I can never remember uh, dates to be, I, I can never remember dates. Hold a second here. Um, uh, let me just bring up, I, I always, so sometimes I'll talk about movie this year. So never take what I say when I'm talking about years uh, very seriously, because I can often not remember what movie came out what year. Was A Quiet Place, so a Quiet Place was 2018, so Black Panther, when was, uh, when was Black Klansman, was that the same year, Black Klansman was, you know, the, I forgot that those were the same year, okay, so, yes, A Quiet Place was my number one film, I just forgot that was 2018, I'm terrible with movie dates, I'm awful, awful, awful with movie dates. Um, but yeah, no, A Quiet Place is my favorite film of 2018. Then would be Black Klansman. Because earlier today, I think on the John Camby show, I said Black Klansman was my favorite. I forgot Quiet Place came out in the same year. Quiet Place was my favorite film of, of that year. Then Black Klansman, then Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So yes, there we go. Uh, yeah, I'm terrible with movie dates, so it doesn't really mean anything. All right, next up, we've got uh, Zach Marcello writes, Watch the day after in between shows, uh, JFC, that depiction is terrifyingly accurate, scares the crap out of me with the current state of the world. Yeah, we talked about that on the John Campia show a little bit earlier today, that 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 TV movie, The Day After Tomorrow, uh, that came out in the 80s, that depicts what would it be like if a nuclear war after actually broke out. And it sucks. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what, like I don't get scared at horror movies 99% of the time, but that movie scared the crap out of me, especially as a kid, but still as an adult, that movie scares the crap out of me. And I can't even imagine what our parents lived through, like with the Cuban missile crisis and all that kind of stuff. I can't even imagine what that must've been like, because really the world was on the brink of nuclear war at a time like, like it looked like it was unavoidable like it was going to happen um certainly it's never fun when you when we hear about like russia saber rattling and all that kind of stuff either but i'm telling you man that movie scared the living crap out of me um all right thanks zach all right next up uh we've got uh, bobby jackson writes Hey, John, the Irvine Spectrum used to be my old stomping grounds. I really like the Irvine Spectrum. I worked at the theater there. Before landing on Riverside, did you and Ann ever consider moving to OC? Did housing ca costs rule it out? No, we we did consider moving into Orange County. Um, housing costs there were 
in certain areas of Orange County, the housing costs were certainly a lot more reasonable than right in Los Angeles, Burbank, Pasadena, that whole thing. But Anne's family lives out here. And that was another factor in it that we got to live a lot closer to Anne's mom in particular. Um, so that had a big part to do with it. But, you know, like Irvine, we can get to the Irvine spectrum in less than 30 minutes. You know, when if the traffic's not ridiculous. But on most nights we can, you know, there'll be a lot of nights where Anne and I will just go, hey, why don't I just go hang out at Irvine Spectrum Center? And we go and hang out at the Spectrum. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. And it's only about 30 minutes from where we are. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Bobby. Appreciate that, man. Next up, Chuck the Mystery writes, Hey, John, if we get the hard reboot at DC, since you believe Peacemaker will continue, what about Viola Davis? If Walker is indeed, would cast, uh, if Waller is indeed still there, uh, would Gunn recast? I think, I think they recast Waller. I think they recast Waller. I mean, because... If you hard reboot, now this is just me guessing, right? But if you hard reboot, and we don't know that they are, but if James Gunn decides to do a hard reboot, then maybe you can keep one or two little elements. Like Peacemaker, that was the biggest show in the world when it was airing. I can't see them getting rid of Peace, Peacemaker. And really, you only have to retcon a couple of tiny, tiny, minor details in, uh, in Peacemaker to continue on with it. But if you do keep Pacemaker, which I think they would, then you've really got to limit the other things you carry over. And and Waller being in Black Adam and being, being in the other Suicide Squad, I don't know. I think that's one they might have to recast. It would suck because you got a queen like Viola Davis in there. But you know me, I, I, my philosophy is if you got to reboot, then reboot. Maybe you get one little thing to take uh, care of something uh, or whatever, but... Yeah, if you got to reboot, you got to reboot. Okay, uh, let's see here. Let's go to the next one. Uh, the next one is uh, My Comic Planet Right. So, uh, Avatar 2 has an 84% on Rotten Tomatoes. Uh, well, we just looked at it, it has an 85 uh, What are your thoughts on the official reviews pouring in? Well, we talked about that a little bit uh, off the top already, right? We actually talked about it a little bit. Um, and I think it's solid. I mean, look, obviously, what you... Any movie you're looking forward to, you want to see 100%, right? You want to see 100%, but that is extremely unlikely. When you're talking about um, a movie like uh, Avatar, where so many people, and you're talking about film critics that are so diverse, that are so diverse where you got so many different film critics that they all have different tastes and they all have different, you know, predispositions and they all have, you know, all, all like different things that they like in movies, certain things that they didn't like in movies and all that kind of stuff to get a rating of 85 is pretty damn impressive, especially when it's a movie that's as big in name as avatar, where so many people are going to come to it, um, with, ideas like they already predetermined they didn't like it or they already predetermined that they did or they or whatever right and 85 percent for a movie that big is pretty impressive again there are better you know you, you got some movies that come into the 90s and that's great but 85 is great that means if you got a hundred critics in a room on the side of the room of the people who liked it you got 85 people and the ones on the other side who didn't like it is only 15 that's pretty impressive for a movie this big so i i think it's perfectly good but again I haven't seen the movie yet myself. I'll see what I think about it in a couple of days. All right. Next up, Chuck the Mystery writes. Uh, oh, sorry, another one from My Comic Planet writes. If the 3D experience in Avatar is as great as everyone is saying, do you think this new 3D tech from James Cameron could change future Star Wars and Marvel films? No. Why? Because the last Avatar movie with its 3D wowed everybody in the world and 3D still died. Right? Like the last Avatar made everybody go, oh my God, 3D! And yet 3D still died. I mean, 3D isn't dead. It still kicks around like a fish out of the water in the boat flopping around. 3D is so useless. But did it did it make everything suddenly adapt? And, and oh my God, now the, the, no, here we are 13 years later, 
Nobody, like hardly anybody uses 3D anymore. Nobody cares about 3D. No matter how good this movie is, no matter how good the 3D is in this movie, I don't think 3D will make a tangible comeback until, and this is just me with my own speculation, but I don't think that it, 3D makes a full tangible comeback until the basic functionality and technology 3D changes. Honestly, glasses less 3D. That's what'll change it. When we get 3D technology that you can have 3D without glasses on, that's when things change. And that's when even I will start to reassess how I feel about 3D. Um, just the whole process and, and, and practice of having to throw these stupid glasses on your face and put this tinted film over your eyes. It's just ridiculous. But once they get to glasses less 3D, then we'll have something to talk about. Uh, other than that, I really don't think it's going to change. I think, I mean, look, I think maybe one or two extra movies will come out in 3D if the 3D in this Avatar 2 is really, really great. But it's not going to make a huge systemic shift in the way the trends of movies are made. But once... You can do 3D without glasses? Uh, then, then let's talk again. Let's talk again at that point. All right. Next up, uh, we've got uh, Chuck the Mister who writes, Also, if Gunn and Saffron would, by some miracle, start with a Justice League film, would they already be locking down a cast uh, to present to Zaslav? Zaslav does not get a say in the cast. All right? That's the type of stuff that Zaslav, as their boss, will not get involved in. Okay. So like when Kevin Feige, uh, if Kevin Feige wanted to make a major, major thing about Marvel, but you know, Bob Iger never got involved in casting decisions as to who was going to play a part. That was never Bob Iger's role. That's not Bob Iger's job. I mean, yeah, Bob Iger, if he wanted to, if Bob Iger or Bob Chapek for that matter, wanted to just step in and go, you know what? I don't like the Australian accent on that Chris Hemsworth guy. Get rid of him. Then, well, yeah, he's the boss and you'd have to do it, but then he'd be an idiot boss because you let the people run their department and you as their boss worry about much, much higher level stuff. Like, hey, are your films appealing to the families who come to our stuff? Are you overspending on your budgets and costing us money? Like, that's the thing the bosses will get concerned with. When it comes to down to the minutia, like, so they'll go to David Zazam says like, this is our plan. What we want to do with this valuable DC property. This is what we're going to do. And the, the boss will give his blessing or he'll whatever. But once that's done, the minutia of approving scripts and the minutia of casting and the minutia of selecting directors, that is something that the boss of Warner brothers as a whole will not get involved in will not get involved in. And by the way, one of the reputations of David Zaslav coming out of Discovery is because remember Discovery had a whole bunch of different divisions and branches. They had, you know, HGTV, they had the Food Network, they had like six or seven other ones all in Discovery. And what David Zaslav's reputation was, and this is why I was excited when I found out he was going to be taking over Warner Brothers, is that while he is a very hands-on boss, at the same time, he just empowers his executives to run their own divisions. He gives oversight, but he lets his executives run their own divisions. So one of the things that James Gunn and uh, Peter Safran will not have to do, and they absolutely shouldn't, is to get David Zaslav's input on casting. That, that That's just not one of the things that'll be his job to do. That's just something you let your executives take care of and you worry about the bigger issues. All right, great question though, Chuck. All right, next up, Jared Vester writes, have you watched Midnight Mass on Netflix? If not, you might think it's too late, but it's still a great show with great characters and great story. Listen, I'll tell you what, Jared, everybody tells me Midnight Mass is fantastic. Everybody tells me Midnight Mass is fantastic. And I never got around to seeing it. And it's it's too late for me to watch it. I mean, maybe at some point down the road, I'll sit down and watch it because everybody talks about how great it is. So I'm definitely, my interest is peaked. I want to watch, but I just don't have time to watch. I got too much other stuff I'm trying to keep up with. Like I haven't even started watching the new season of Doom Patrol. And you guys know how much I love Doom Patrol. So 
I'm, I'm it just, it's too far. It's too far gone for me to get on board with it now, but yeah, one of these days, you know, I'll have maybe Anne will go on a work trip somewhere for four or five days and I'll be sitting at home. It's like, well, I got some time to kill and probably midnight mass will be one of the ones that I pick up, but I keep hearing from people, Jared, that it's awesome. So I'm really looking forward to watching it when I do get a chance. All right. My comic planet writes. Avatar 2 is tracking to earn $525 million plus in the film's worldwide box office opening weekend. I'm sorry, but I find this hard to believe. Why is that hard to believe? I mean, look, what there's a reason why you never count worldwide box office on opening weekend. Because... Every film opens in a different number of territories on its opening weekend. Like we off with this, this topic has come up a lot, but like the topic of, Hey John, people write in, why, when you talk about opening weekend numbers, you only talk about domestic opening weekend numbers. But when you talk about a film's overall box office, you talk about worldwide because when you're talking about overall box office, that's apples to apples comparisons because that's after a movie's come out and after it's been released and all the territories is going to be released and you talk about what its overall money making is. That's apples to apples comparison. With opening weekend though, you can't do that because some films will open in North America and 12 other territories on one week uh, on its opening weekend. Some movies will open in North America and 40 other territories. Well then What's the point in comparing the opening, the worldwide opening weekend of a movie A and movie B if one movie opened in 13 territories and another theater, or another movie opened in 89 territories, right? There's no point in trying to compare them. So um, anyway, that being said, when we talk about opening weekend, we, and if you, you only ever, the reason the industry only ever focuses on what, when you say, what was the opening weekend? You're only referring to domestic numbers because that becomes apples to apples. How much did movie A make in the North American box office on its opening weekend? How much did movie B make in the North American box office on its opening weekend? That's the level playing field. But depending on how broad Avatar The Way of Water's opening weekend is, like I don't know how many territories it's opening in, but we know it's getting a China release. I just don't know if it's opening up this weekend in China or not. But let's say it opened in um, the U.S., in uh, almost every market in Europe, China, uh, you know, all the, all the, if it opened in like 85 territories, why can't it make 500 plus million on opening weekend? Why not? I mean, we all know it's going to be big. We all know it's going to be huge. So we'll see. I'm thinking North American, it'll be about 185 million. But at 185 million, that just means the rest of the world has to do like another 300 something million dollars and it gets there. Now, whether it does or doesn't, I don't know. We'll see. I don't really care about the worldwide opening weekend number. I just care about the actual opening weekend number, which is the domestic. And I think it's going to be around 185. Maybe it'll be higher than that. We'll have to wait and see. All right. Let's see here. Thanks a lot for that Common Planet. Uh, or yeah, that was Common Planet, right? Yes. All right, next up. Uh, Vixter5001 writes, D Damien Chazelle has signed a first look direct directing slash producing deal with Paramount. It's been a great year for Paramount. I'll tell you what, dude, this has been a fabulous year for Paramount. It has, it is lit and it's been a long time. It has been a long time since we've been able to say this. But for the past couple of years, Paramount has been nothing but win after win after win after win. Big, big scale wins with stuff like uh, Top Gun, obviously, but then smaller scale wins with like smaller films that have really overperformed and stuff like that. They've been positioning themselves great. I think Paramount Plus is a terrific streaming service. Um, and now stuff like this. And by the way, and a first look deal does not mean Damien Chazelle cannot direct films for other studios. A first look deal simply means that whatever Damien Chazelle comes up with, with his own little production company, whatever projects he comes up with, Paramount has the right to be the first people to look at it and give an offer to it. Now, somebody else who developed their own movie can still come to Damien Chazelle and say, hey, will you just come and direct this movie for us? And he can do that. Or he can come up with an idea for a movie 
take it to Paramount first and Paramount may say, hey, that looks interesting, but it's not for us. We're going to pass on it. And then Damien can then take it to Universal or to Warner Brothers or to Disney or whatever and go. But uh, yeah, being able to get a guy like Damien Chazelle, who of course is the director who did things like Whiplash, uh, who did First Man, who did La La Land. Now he's got um, Babylon coming out with Margot Robbie and Brad Pitt. Uh, that's a huge score for them, but they have had a great last couple of years. Bravo to Paramount, man. Bravo, because it it has been a number of years. I feel like for the last eight years or so, it's been like, man, how much longer can Paramount survive? But the last couple of years, I feel like they've been cranking out win after win after win. So congratulations to Paramount. Uh, it's good to see them getting a little bit uh, back on their feet and getting stronger again. All right. My Comic Planet again writes in and says, some people who saw Avatar 2 said the 48 frames per second format made the film look like a super animated video game, hoping that won't take me out of the movie. Well, I mean, that's the same kind of, we talked about that before, right? That's the same kind of thing that happened with The Hobbit, right? Because The Hobbit used the high frame rate, 48 frames, 60 frames, stuff like that. Like it gives, it gives the film more of a video feel. Now, the reality is, and I remember we talked about this when The Hobbit's movies came out. 48 frames, 60 frames is superior. There's no getting around. It, it is better. You are get, it is, you're getting uh, more information into each second of imagery that is hitting your eyeballs. It is a superior technically technique, but it's not what we're used to seeing. Our eyes for almost a century have been adjusted to, have been accustomed to when we watch a movie to seeing a movie in 24 frames per second. That's what we're used to seeing. So that's what we mean when we say it has a movie look, right? It's at 24 frames per second. So it is kind of funny because the people who make this argument are right. 60 frames, 48 frames, these are superior formats. But what we are used to, what I am personally accustomed to seeing is 24 frames per second. And so something doesn't quite look right to me when I see something in 48 or 60. The question will be, does it work for the movie? I, I'm okay if it's a little off-putting to me at first, but if it then brings me into it, then I'll be fine with it. We'll see when when I see it myself whether it takes me out of the movie or not. But I'm hoping it won't. I'm hoping it won't. All right, thanks for sending that in, my Comic Planet. All right, next up. You know, I'm going to put in the live chat here for a second. I'm going to put in the live chat, for those of you who are here, um, a quick poll. Um, are you planning on seeing Avatar Two, a simple question. Like we've been talking a lot about Avatar Two today. It is Avatar Week. Uh, we talked about the critic reviews that come out. It's got an eighty-five percent right now. Very, very strong. The initial reactions were good. There's already awards buzz going around for Avatar Two. It is the sequel to the biggest film of all time. So just put it to you guys. If you're watching live, and only if you're watching live, I just put up a poll in the live thing. I've already got one hundred and seventy-five votes. 74% of you are saying, yes, you are planning to see Avatar uh, this week. 25%, well, now it's 75% are saying you're planning to see it. 25% of you are saying not. Well, now we've got uh, 215 votes and 77% of you are saying you're going to go see it. 23% of you are saying no. So it's about a three to one ratio, maybe a little bit better than three to one ratio that of you guys are planning to go to see Avatar. So I know I'm one of them. I know I'm one of them. All right, guys. Thanks a lot for participating in that poll. Appreciate that. Okay. Let's keep things going here. Uh, Chuck, the mystery writes earlier on the John campus show, when discussing residuals, you briefly mentioned backend points for my own clarification. What are points are our points negotiated in an initial contract? Yes. Uh, points are negotiated. They're not standard by any sense. Now, some of you might be asking what are points? Uh, in the most, I'm going to oversimplify it here, but just to give you a basic idea, a point is basically a percentage, you know, um, when you are going to do a movie and you say, okay, we'll pay you $500,000 to be in this movie. Plus we'll give you two points. That's 2% of what the movie makes. Now, then it gets more tricky. It's like, well, is that 2% of what its overall box office is? Or is it 2% of what the profits of the box office are? That's all going to be in the, the the contract. But basically speaking, we say we'll give you uh, $4 million. The reason Robert Downey Jr. made so much money in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is because they his agent negotiated points. 
And so all of a sudden, so you hear like Robert Downey Jr. got paid $50 million for doing that movie. Well, he didn't get paid $50 million. He got paid probably $10 million for the film, but his points on the box office in those Marvel movies made him another $40 million because it was some, he got, he nego- his agents negotiated some incredible, incredible amount of points. But yes, those are all negotiated in the contracts. And sometimes they will give you uh, points and sometimes they will not. They're going to like, no, we're not going to give you 5% of the box office. Are you crazy? Uh, but, but yeah, the, but yes, it's absolutely negotiated in the contracts. All right. TY writes, uh, what do you think Gunn will do about Batman? Uh, the DCU will need a fully fledged Batman, but there's already a, uh, rev, a oh, Reeves verse is saying Reeves verse going on right now. They can both run at the same time. You can have one dedicated Batman to the DCU, and then you can have this Elseworld DCU or this Elseworld Batman thing going. Look, I've said for a long time, people are going to say, Robert Pattinson's Batman is going to be in, is going to cross over with Joaquin Phoenix's Joker. No, he's not. No, he's not. Um, Robert Pattinson's and Matt Reeves' Batman universe is going to continue to run. It's going to be outside of everything else, much like Christopher Nolan's Batman ran outside of everything. So they will have that Batman and then they will have a Batman in the DCU. At least that's what I believe. I mean, I think that's clearly what they're going to do. Now, you never know. I haven't talked to James about this personally. So you never know. But it seems to me to make the most sense that that's the approach that they will take. You're going to have Matt Reeves, Batman. By the way, that Batman will only probably go like three films. So it's not like the next 10 years you're going to have two Batman going at the same time. I, I'm guessing the Matt Reeves Batman with Robert Pattinson will probably be a trilogy, much like Christopher Nolan's was, and then it'll be wrapped up. But I think you're going to have that story going on, and then you're going to have the DCU, which is totally different and totally separate, and it'll have its own single one Batman running around it. At least that's my guess right now. All right, good question, T.Y. All right, next up, uh, we've got John Redcorn writes, If Spider-Verse 2 and 3 are as good as the first film, Lord and Miller need to be in charge of the Sony-verse. No, they don't. Uh, Fans trust them, and Sony need a win after Morbius. Listen, just because you were able to make... Just because you're able to... And by the way, they did not direct those films. They were producers on those films. But just because you're able to make a a good animated series of films, and my God, Spider-Man and the Spider-Verse is incredible... But this whole thing about what they do that well, they should be in charge of Sony. No, they shouldn't. No, they shouldn't. I love Lord and Miller. You know I love Lord and Miller. But I don't think even with the great, great success of that animated thing, I don't think that automatically means they're going to be able to tell great live action stories uh, with these characters because we have different expectations when we go to the animated side versus what we want on the live action side. Listen, I'm not saying Lord Miller are disqualified by any sense of the imagination. Not at all. I love Lord Miller. But what I'm saying is just because an animated story they do turns out to be mwah, chef's kiss, exquisitely awesome, doesn't necessarily mean that they should be in charge of the whole thing. I, I don't know why we as fans jump to that all the time. I, I, I just, it's, it's, it baffles me a little bit, but no, I, I disagree. I do not think that de facto Lord Miller should take over Sonyverse. Not necessarily. I would, I would love to see them do a live action, um, Sonyverse movie and show that they can do that with some grit, with the levity that they've shown they can bring to things, but also show that they can, on top of the levity that they have, that they can also bring the grit and the action and all that kind of stuff. And if they do that, then we can have a different conversation. But me personally, as a fan and as a big fan of Lord and Miller, I personally would need to see that first before handing them the keys to the Sony. Yeah. Morbius was terrible, but Venom was awesome. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what anybody says. Venom was awesome. Uh, Venom two, not quite as good, but I still really liked it. So, uh, and Morbius was a dud. Morbius was a dud, but that was, that was, that was one movie. Um, so we'll see. We will see. All right. And, and let's, by the way, I'm very curious to see how Craven turns out. I'm really, really curious to see how Craven turns out. Now I haven't heard what Sony itself feels about the, the project so far. I have heard that, uh, I almost said Kegel, Mike, Keegan, Michael key, not Keegan, Michael key, uh, uh, kick ass. Um, 
uh, three named dude in Kick Ass. Anyway, I, I heard the di- the guy starring in Kick Ass, um, really loves it. But but that that's just one guy. That's just one opinion from one guy. That doesn't necessarily mean anything. Uh, but yeah, the guy, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Sorry, Aaron, Aaron Taylor Johnson. Um, I've, I have heard that Aaron Taylor Johnson loves it. Now that doesn't mean Sony loves it. That doesn't mean anybody else loves it. That doesn't mean I'll love it. Doesn't mean you'll love it or whatever. Uh, oh, and by the way, a couple of people in the live chat, thank you for throwing in the name, Aaron Taylor Johnson, Mufasa and hello there and thing, but, um, it doesn't mean anybody else will, but I've heard he really, really likes it. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, next up, we've got Dallas designer who writes, Sorry if this has been asked already. I've missed a few open mics. Over under 40% Saturday Night Live brings back Ryan Gosling for a sequel to <laughs> Papyrus. Um, hey, listen, if, didn't they, wait a second, didn't they already do that? So for those of you who don't know, uh, Ryan Gosling, who was hosting Saturday Night Live, they did this sketch of him, this fake sketch of him, like coming up with the font that was used in Avatar. And it was called Papyrus because that's the name of the font. And did they not already do a follow up to that? Guys in the live chat, help me, help me out there. I I've got this little itch in my brain saying that maybe they already did do a follow up to that sketch. A- at any rate, if Ryan Gosling has something to come back to host for Saturday Night Live for, because generally actors only come on and host Saturday Night Live when they've got something to promote. Uh, if they do, I'm sure they will. But something tells me in the back of my head um, that that he might have already done it. I'm not sure about that. Not sure. But if not, then I'm sure they will at some point. It's a really good sketch. If you haven't seen that sketch, good take Dallas's advice or go look it up on YouTube because it's it's pretty funny. All right. Next up, we got the man with the master plan. And this is the final uh, question here today. Um, and it's a $20 super chat. Thank you, man with the master plan for supporting us on the level, level. That's awesome, man. Man with the master plan writes, hey, John and team, I was tasked to host a virtual holiday party at work and I did a movie password game. Nice. Based on your show, my team had fun. So thank you. But some of the easy clues weren't a slam dunk. No one knew who no one knew who Clark Kent was. What? I have a hard time believing that. Come on. Like you gave the clue Clark Kent and nobody knew you were talking about Superman. Is that what you're saying? I can't believe that. Like even somebody who has never, ever, 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 ever. Um, no one who has ever. I've never come across somebody anywhere, ever, at any time, who has not known who Clark Kent is. I've, I've, I mean, that's, really? Maybe I'm misunderstanding your, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying. Maybe I, I'm not fully grasping or understanding what you're saying, but I've never come across anybody who did not know that. But, oh, well, I, hey, hey. Not everybody travels in the same circles as we do, man. Not everybody are film fans. Some people are completely not interested whatsoever. But anyway, I'm glad you were able to play the game um, and uh, and uh, with with your folks. And I'm glad you guys had a good time with that. Um, so, guys, I'm looking through to see if I missed anything. And no, I think it looks like we got everything. Thank you so much, guys, for being here today and for participating in today's installment of Open Mic. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and again, big special thank you to all you guys who sent in those Super Chats, number one, because you gave us great fun things to talk about. But number two, you supported this channel as you did and all of us involved with the channel. Thank you guys so very much. Don't forget to come back and join us again tomorrow for the next installment of the John Campy Show. It'll be tomorrow. It'll be me, Rob, and Chris Carr will be on. We hope that you guys will join us as well. So for myself, thank you guys for being here. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye.